Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. So welcome to the podcast, everybody, and happy new year to you. Everyone's setting goals, reflecting back on last year, what they could do differently this year. When you're setting flying goals, please don't be like the gym membership that you bought, that you quit by March. If you have been waiting for the right time to start learning to fly, this is for you, okay? If you don't know where to start and you need some advice, this is for you. And also, if you've started to learn to fly and you're really not progressing very well and you're thinking of giving up, please do not give up learning to fly. You'll only come back to it later on and it's gonna cost you a ton more money. So let's get this shit done. Let's get some advice for you so we can get you remotivated and uh, starting up again, okay? So let's go back to that first scenario then. You've been waiting for the right time. Spoiler alert, there is no right time to learn to fly other than when you have the time or the money, okay? The time and the money even. Forget the weather. You will see bad weather all year round. We're in England. If you wanna fly in England, deal with it. There's bad weather all year round. And what's more, if you don't know how to judge the weather in the UK and you go and learn to fly in a a sunnier climate, should we say, when you come back to fly in the UK, you're gonna be scared to fly in UK weather, okay? You need to know what weather you can fly in what weather you shouldn't fly in and be able to make that judgment really, you know, really uh, safely. But as a rule, 40% of your lessons as a student will be cancelled due to weather. So scenario two, you don't know where to start. We've got six steps giving you a logical structured approach to this. There is some freebies with this episode, by the way. So please do stay till the end. So we've got some freebies, some useful bits for you. So if you don't know where to start, step one, okay, and there are links for this in the in the show notes. We have a 24 page guide. It's a free learn to fly guide. And in there, you're going to find out what happens in the trial lesson, choosing a license that fits your needs, budgeting for flight training, medicals, choosing a flight school, making a plan for your training, okay? Choosing an aircraft, flight equipment, theory training and exams, flight training, FRTOL, which is the flight radio telephony operator's license, training and test, and then what to do next. So it's a 24 page guide. This is the most up-to-date information that we have, okay? It's up-to-date now as we speak. So when you're researching learning to fly, please don't go on Google and find some rubbish information from three years ago that's out of date. And to be honest, looking at what we did when we wrote this guide, this is about the best information you're gonna get your hands on. So please go in the show notes the link is there for you so that's step one read the learn to fly guide step two is book a trial lesson you don't want to be signing up to any course of training without doing a trial lesson first it's going to give you the opportunity to visit the location you're flying at visit the school the facilities meet the team see if you like the people there you're going to get to fly an aircraft hands-on now with a trial lesson you'll pretty much fly it from straight and level so as soon as the takeoff's done and the aircraft's level out you'll have control of the aircraft all the way back down to rejoining the circuit to come back in and land so you're going to be flying for the majority of the flight What's more, you can log that time towards your training. So it's not a waste of time at all. You can log that. It's actually exercise three and four of the PPL or LAPL syllabus. So third step is have a consultation. Now, what is a consultation? It's a meeting with your school where you can go through your goals, your circumstances around your time and finance. Make sure that the chosen license fits your goals okay so you can ask questions about the license to make sure you've chosen the right one an overview of your flight training plan finding the right route for training um, that fits your circumstance i.e fast track or learn at your own pace courses that kind of thing and answer any outstanding questions you have now this should take around about an hour to an hour and a half typically from my experience most flight schools will not give you that amount of time it's a quick 20 minute conversation now my opinion is when you spend in somewhere in the region of £17,000 on training, uh, which is what the average person spends at the moment, they should be giving you the time before you make that decision. So if you walk into a flying school and they say they give you a 10, 20 minute conversation and you walk out with more questions and answers, forget it, you're in the wrong place. Step four, 
you want to give this some serious thought. You want to go away from that school. Don't sign up to anything there and then. You need to make sure from a time perspective, a financial perspective that you can commit to training. Because depending on how long you're doing it, it could be a few a few months or it could be even years if, you, if you're doing it, learn at your own pace. So make sure that you've got the resources to finish the course. You've got all the information. You're comfortable doing what you're going to do because it's a big investment. And if you don't finish the course, you're going to walk away with a ton of spend with no results. Step five. This is when you've made the decision to start training. Sign up to the Civil Aviation Authority SELMA, that's C-E-L-L-M-A portal. On there, you're going to sign up for medical services. And once you've signed up, there will be like a registration uh, process, which takes a few days where you send them some ID off and all that kind of stuff. But when you've done that and it comes back, um, then they're going to send you a medical questionnaire called a Med160 to fill out. And once you've filled that out, then and only then can you book a medical with your AME, the Aeromedical Examiner. You can find a list of Aeromedical Examiners on the, the CAA website. If you're local to us in Coventry or Northampton, please get in touch and we can put you in touch with a, a doctor who comes here twice a week. Medical. Get your medical pretty much as soon as you've decided to learn to fly or to, to start training anyway. Get that medical either within the first few hours of your training or before you start training. That way then if you do have any problems they can be resolved quickly without wasting any time or worst case scenario you find out that you can't get a medical then you haven't spent sort of £5,000 already on flight training to find that out. Step six is make a commitment. You wouldn't believe how many people I see entering flight training and they are what I call serial trial lessoners. They come in and they have a trial lesson, they have a trial lesson, they have a trial lesson. A trial lesson is exactly that, a trial lesson. It covers exercise three and four. You're going to keep going around covering the same old thing. Unless you make a commitment to training, you will never get anywhere. And I know this because I did this. I did several trial lessons and I was all I was doing was telling my friends, oh yeah, I'm having flying lessons. No, you're not. You're having trial lessons, okay? You're not progressing through a course of training. So make a commitment. At this point, obviously, you're looking at booking your medical if you haven't already done so. And give yourself a financial commitment. Pay for a membership at your flying school. Actually sign up to a course of training. It's a commitment. It's not a big commitment, but it gives you some sort of financial commitment. So you've paid your year's membership or whatever. Um, it means that you're invested in it. You're invested in it because you've signed up to a course. You're not just doing trial lessons. You've put some money into it. So you've got a financial commitment. Buy all your flight equipment so that you've got it there. You know what it looks like. Start using it. Read the books as well. Book one, which comes in most flight equipment packs, is all to do with your flight lessons. So you need to be reading up on these before you even turn up to a flight lesson. So it's really good to get this stuff early. Believe me, the worst thing you can do is start a course of training without any commitment. More people give up than actually get through if they, if they start in that manner. So scenario three then, you've started training, but you're not progressing. Okay, this is all too common and it usually starts from not having the commitment and all the other bits we've just spoken about. So first thing you want to do is, if you're not progressing very well, is go back to your school, okay, and say to them, look, can I speak to somebody about my training? I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere, because it might be that it's just your opinion that you're not making good progress. Maybe you've got higher expectations for yourself than what's possible. Or maybe you are actually not making any decent progress and you need some help. But sometimes... And it shouldn't really be the case, but you might need to ask for this help. We monitor our students' progress monthly and, and try and pick up any issues as we go. But sometimes it's difficult to judge because everyone's individual. You know, everyone learns at different paces, so you can't pigeonhole people. Um, but it, it is good to check on people's progress. So go back to your school, ask them if their opinion is the same. You know, am I not making the progress? So here are the six most common reasons that people generally don't make progress. The first and the biggest one is infrequent flying. So when I say infrequent flying, the bare minimum number of flights you want to be doing a month uh, is two. Okay, you want to be doing two flight lessons a month. If you can't afford to do that, I would recommend waiting till the time is better. If you're doing one flight lesson a month or less, you're going to make terrible progress. Trust me, I did it. I found it really hard. You're constantly going back over the same things and you feel like you're not making any progress. Then you get frustrated. Then you talk yourself into the next bad lesson and the next one and you end up giving up. So infrequent flying is the, the biggest one, I would say. And these are the reasons why most people fly uh, infrequently. One is lack of financial planning. It's budgeting. 
in the learn to fly guide there is some information about budgeting okay now the biggest thing about budgeting is don't just budget for the cost of the airplane and the instructor because there are lots more things you need to pay for in your training exams uh, you know you've got tests and things that you're doing you've got equipment landing fees all these kind of things they all add up and if you just take into account the minimum hours for your airplane only you're going to be about six thousand pounds out i can absolutely guarantee you you know most people do not pass a pbl in 45 hours so yet the national average is 60 so please do not budget just for the airplane instructor and the minimum hours because you're going to be really really disappointed and the worst thing you can do is get part way through the training and realize you haven't got enough funds to finish it so again read the learn to fly guide that's going to give you some budgeting information use that information in there so the things that are listed that you may want to consider and go back to your school and say to them can i just get a breakdown of these costs so i can rebudget for it make sure that you can still afford it if you can't afford it then you know maybe you need to think about how you're going to deal with that perhaps there are things you can do to boost your income to help you out perhaps there are things that you're spending money on that you could cut back so you've got more money to fly or perhaps you just need to quit and come back when the time's better. Depends on your circumstances, obviously. But, you know, you, you really do want to get a budget, look at your income and expenditure and see if it lines up. But the bare minimum, two lessons a month, really, to, to make any decent progress. Second is aircraft and instructor availability. Now, this can be avoided in most cases if you pre-plan. So generally speaking most flight schools have got part-time instructors and you know the aircrafts are booked up so it's very unlikely if you're very bad at planning that you're going to ring up with two days notice and get a lesson so what you need to do is is book in advance okay that's going to help you uh, overcome that uh, weather so use weather to your advantage when the weather's bad get yourself ahead with the theory stuff because a lot of people they just they get very demotivated by the bad weather and they just sit at home doing nothing whereas a good student will be in the school anyway asking if there's another lesson that they could do that the weather's suitable for or you know let's get some exams done you know don't be sat there thinking that the flying is the be all and end all right it is important but there is so much more to be doing you could be doing your radio telephony training your frtol exam you know theory exams all that stuff i get really annoyed with students who moan about oh i'm not flying enough i'm not flying enough because the weather's bad but when you look at their training records they haven't been in for weeks but yet they've still got most of the exams left to do if this is you pull your finger out right get the other stuff done it's just as important okay lack of time availability now this should really be something that you consider before you start training okay each flight lesson you're going to need to have about two or three hours at the airport you need to plan to do around about 100 hours of study at home with the theory stuff and revising for your practical flying lessons. So you need to be able to have that time to do it. So when you're looking at your time availability, please do make sure that you don't just think of this flight lesson that you're turning up for as just one hour, because we all know that is not the case. And likewise, if you're struggling to do the theory exams and all that kind of stuff because you're not putting in the effort at home it's never going to get any better unless you start putting in the effort so start looking at your time drains you know how long are you spending on social media each day because i know for a fact that i spend about two hours a day because my phone tells me i do tv all this stuff that you could put on the back burner for a bit to get yourself further ahead with the flying training also with time we obviously everyone needs to work okay so some people really struggle getting the time to fly. They really want to do it, but they struggle and they're the typical sort of person who can only do a Saturday. Now, everyone wants to fly on a Saturday because less people are at work, okay? So it's easier. Um, but that is going to cause you a problem. So if you can fly in the week, that is going to give you a better result generally. So perhaps speak to your employers. A lot of employers are a lot more flexible these days and they might give you time off in the week to go and do this if you make up the time elsewhere. Or if you're on shifts, see if you can fix your shifts fix a weekday maybe where you can go and fly so lack of commitment or accountability this is a big one you need to commit to a course and be accountable to it as well as your school okay so there's a there's an element of accountability from the school they should be accountable for your training but you need to put some in yourself you can't buy a pilot's license you can't go in i'm sure there's it's at least three people i can think of that i've seen over the years who who literally if you could have sold them the license without any training they would have bought it but the fact of the matter is you've got to put some effort in yourself 
if you're kind of putting off doing ground school and all that sort of stuff, you've got to really ask yourself, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Okay, because you can't get a pilot's license without doing this stuff. So I'd recommend that you revisit the reasons why you wanted to do this in the first place. If your reasons aren't strong enough, you won't finish it. You know, if all you're trying to do is impress your mates down the pub, oh yeah, I've, you know, I go, I do flying lessons, whatever. That only lasts for a bit when you realise actually I've got to put a bit of hard work in here. So you tend to find the people who do really well at the course have got a stronger reason why they're doing it. So maybe they're going to be an airline pilot. Those sort of people don't mess around. It's going to be their job. They want to get it done. They want to get it done fast. Or they've had a burning ambition to do it. It's been something they've always wanted to do. But they commit to training. They don't serially have trial lessons you know that's just messing around but you know he said about accountability your school should hold you accountable you should hold yourself accountable so if things aren't going well you know you can change it if you're not having a good time at your school you don't have to stay there you could go and speak to them try and resolve it if you can't resolve it go somewhere else if you're not doing well with your exams you've got to ask yourself why are you putting the effort in or do you need some help if you need some help ask for some help don't mess about get it done medical delays so this is a really big one, okay? If you leave your medical till the last minute until you need to go solo and things happen, you're going to be in a world of pain because let's say, first example, you've got um, a problem that's going to take a few months to resolve. Then you're kind of stuck in the circuit wherever you were, not making any progress. What I would recommend in this circumstance, if this is you, is speak to your school, fly less frequently, but focus now on getting the FRTOL done, the flight radio telephony operator's license, getting your theory exams done. So when you come back to flying more frequently, you've got more focus on it because you've covered some other areas. And then speak to them to say, is there any of the lessons further on in the course that we could move on to? So we're not just flying the circuit, making no progress each week. We're just keeping currency effectively. So what I'd say is maybe move on to do some like precautionary landings, PFLs, start doing the navigation work so you're making some progress you're still flying until you're able to go solo so flying different aircraft types this is a big no-no so i actually had it's only um, happened once when i've seen it this extreme i had a guy from he said to me look i'm considering moving schools I'm not making much progress and i said oh, that's all right well come in we'll have a chat um, bring your logbook okay now his logbook was impressive. <laughs> he had 70 hours logged, okay, and five or so different aircraft types, completely different aircraft types. And I said to him, how the hell did you get in this position? And what he said to me was he was, he was basically not planning very well. He was leaving his lessons really, really late to book. And he was just flying whatever the school had available. The school weren't discouraging him from doing this. And he'd just been bashing the circuit for hours and hours and hours. He was at 70 hours, seven, zero hours. I actually thought I misheard him to start off with. I thought he said 17. Now, what that says to me is several things. A, he's probably not the most competent student, which isn't a problem. You know, you can be taught how to fly. But he's got all these different variables. He's flying all these different aeroplanes. How the hell are you going to learn to land an aeroplane when you're flying a different one each week and not just a different 152 or PA-28? It's a different type of aeroplane. You know, he's flying grobs. He was flying PA-28s for 172s, 152s. There was something else as well. There's no consistency there whatsoever. If you're flying loads of different aircraft type, just stop. OK, speak to your school and say, look, you know, I only want to fly one type of aircraft. So can you find me an aircraft that I can just stick to? So whether it's a whatever it is, you know, it could be a PA-28, whatever it is. Ask them if they can do that. If they can't do that for you, for whatever reason, then go. Go somewhere else where they can give you the same aircraft all the time because you will make no progress or much slower progress, okay? It's a little bit like having driving lessons to learn how to drive and one week your, your instructor turns up in a Fiesta, next week he turns up in a Ferrari, next week he turns up in a truck, right? You're not going to be able to drive all these different things easily, okay? So instructor issues, all schools will face instructor issues, especially at the minute. We're in the middle of pretty much a UK, I want to call it an instructor crisis because it feels like it. Um, all schools at the minute are crying out for instructors. And the reason being is that after COVID, the things that went on in the airlines when they were retiring older crew and promoting younger crew, now they're desperate for pilots. There is a huge pilot shortage. So anybody looking to be a commercial pilot, now is a good time. OK, um, however, it has impacted the training industry because all of the schools are struggling 
to get instructors, okay? All of them. So it's got to the point where people are training their own instructors. They are training um, people, building them through the ranks, training them as instructors. So what you tend to find is, in most schools, your average instructor works two, three days a week, and then he has another job. Uh, maybe he's an airline pilot, or maybe he does other things with a view to them becoming an airline pilot later on. Or third scenario is generally retired airline pilots who are doing this for fun. As a, you know, they want to give back afterwards. So what I'd advise is if you're having problems getting regular instructors and all that kind of stuff, is book well in advance. That will avoid most of that stuff. Um, and try and if you have like a favorite instructor, try and align your booking days with the days that you know they're scheduled to work because they tend to stick to the same days. Okay, that will resolve those kind of issues. But you do need to be able to be confident to fly with several instructors. So the, the big problem is if you end up flying with too many instructors and perhaps you're underconfident anyway because it, it doesn't give you as much continuity as you would like. So again, pre-planning um, is, is better for that. But generally it's down to the school to make sure that their standardization is good so that if you fly between instructors, the practices are all the same. So with us, for example, we have a, a, a monthly instructor meeting where we go through our standardization as, as some of the... Um, some of the points that we talk about. So we have specific ways of teaching certain things. So for example, crosswind technique, we use crab technique rather than wing down method. And we stick to that. So everyone teaches crab method. It doesn't mean that we can't vary that. So if a student, for example, every now and again, you, you'll you get a student who doesn't feel comfortable flying in a crab position, in a sideways kind of motion when you're coming into land. Um, so you may need to vary these things to suit one person. But the rule is we teach crab technique unless the student is not comfortable with it. Okay. So low confidence. This is a big one. Um, we see lots of people who generally aren't very confident and their confidence needs to be built. Now you need to raise these people's confidence and help them, encourage them. Okay, so sometimes it might be like an instructor mismatch. If you, you know, some people have certain styles of teaching, you know, some people are a bit more pushy and, you know, they require certain standards and things like that. And other people are a bit more relaxed and have a different manner. So I know that from experience, if I had somebody who was a bit pushy and didn't want to find the good in what you were doing then now I found that demotivating so I preferred somebody who would encourage you a little bit more um, so everyone has a different kind of style so if you're low confidence you want to make sure that you're married with the right type of instructor who you feel is building your confidence rather than eroding it um, but the biggest thing you need to understand about this okay is that you don't know what you don't know so a lot of it is just about repetition keep doing it trust the process and you will eventually get to where you need to be it doesn't matter how long it takes as long as you can afford to do it but your school should be indicating to you if it's taking you know a little bit longer and um, they'll sit down with you and say look you know what, what do we do to, to help you but the big thing is don't compare yourself to other people now I remember seeing a student really, really uh, just rattle through the course when I was really struggling and they had the same instructor as me and it really pissed off at the time. I thought, what the f is this guy doing that's different to me? And, it, and most of it was he was more committed and he was flying a hell of a lot more frequently than I was and that was it. You know, different results for different people, but generally the people who do better have a higher commitment so they're flying more frequently, they, they put time into it. One of the ways of avoiding pretty much all of these problems is by doing like a more intensive training now we have a fast track program now i would say more than 70 percent now i think from the last time i checked more than 70 percent of our students do it this way now because it's just better okay it gives you a much better chance of success because we've planned to remove most of these obstacles for you by planning your course in advance for you okay so you don't have to do it i did say i had some offers and things for you so first offer is there's currently 504 pounds off fast track uh for 2024 okay so there is a link in the show notes to that particular course and the discount please have a read through that and then if you're interested um, and you've done a trial lesson already then come in for a consultation let's get you booked in if you are one of those people who is sort of a bit on the fence still not really sure if they're ready to commit to a course but they don't just want to do a trial lesson or maybe you've done a trial lesson already we've got a five hour course for you now this is a really good course because we're going to actually progress you 
through the lessons in the syllabus rather than just repeating trial lessons. So with this five hour package, you get the following things for free. You get a learn to fly guide, you get a free consultation, you get a free subscription to PPL Expert, which is our online training portal where you can practice some of the tests for the theory exams. You get three months free membership. The paid stuff, you get five hours flight instruction, okay? That can go towards PPL or LAP, or you can log it towards that. You get some flight equipment, so you get a log book to log these hours in. You get flying book one, which is the first book, which basically goes through the flying lesson. So it details the exercise number. It tells you how the lesson's conducted with some pictures and all that kind of stuff. So you can kind of get the grasp of it before you come in for your briefing. And you get a high-vis vest, which is what you need to be walking outside on the apron. And all of that comes as a package, okay? There's £100 off that package at the moment. There's a link in the show notes. So on a final note, though, if you've been putting off learning to fly for years, please stop making excuses. Go and have a go, okay? Do a trial lesson. If you don't like it, don't do it. You know, maybe try the five-hour packages, but don't be sat here again next year in January going, oh, yeah, I'd really like to be a pilot because you can talk about it all you want, but more is said than done in most things. Lastly, though, please enjoy the process. It's supposed to be fun after all, okay? So, you know, if you're not having fun at the moment, go and sort it out. You know, go and speak to your school. Let's, you know, get some progress made, okay? Because generally you start having fun when you feel the progress, okay? And if you haven't started already, come on, get on with it. A happy new year to you all. I hope you found this episode helpful and I hope it re-motivated you a little bit. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, Leave us a review. It really does help us grow the channel. Um, Please do visit the the links in uh, in the show notes. And thanks again. I'll see you on the next episode. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode.